Welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show, your one-stop shop for weird news, spooky, otherworldly, and paranormal shenanigans. We'll take a dive into what's going on in creepy pop culture. You can follow us on Twitter at creepin' underscore it, and like us on Facebook at The Creepin' It Real Show. Do you have a paranormal story you'd like to share with us? You can email us at creepinitrealshow at gmail.com. Hello and welcome to this week's Creepin' It Real Show. I am your host, Christy, for the week. Uh, with me is Moni from SoCal. Really, really SoCal now, by the way. I looked you up <laughs> where you were and I was like, whoa, she is as south as south can be. How are you doing? Uh, yes, just this side of Mexico, but <laughs> it is gorgeous here. We love it. And I'm doing good. We spent the day at the horse races yesterday um, in Del Mar, which was nice and close for us. And it's fabulous time with family and the littles got to run around. So everything's going well. Very nice. Yardley, how are you doing? Everything's good. Can't complain. The only thing I did this weekend was relax and pickled a few peppers from the garden. I saw mm. on your Instagram. Those look good. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm doing fine. Um, I woke nothing like waking up this morning and reading about three mass shootings that happened yesterday. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna try to. I just wanted to acknowledge because it's hard sometimes to get up and you read news like that and then do a show. But luckily for us, we're doing an equally depressing show, so we can just channel all of this um, frustration into telling a equally messed up, fucked up story um, upcoming. So. We'll go ahead and dive into our um, weird news. Yardley, you've got some It Chapter 2 updates. Yeah, actually, I do. So in an interview um, with Total Film via Sci-Fi.com, director Andy Muschietti um, shared some tidbits on how the movie would use the aging technology on the child actors. And also Stephen King wrote a scene for if chapter two as well. So it's kind of funny when we think about this de-aging stuff, it's generally with um, a lot of senior um, and just, you know, older actors there tending to take them back. So I think we never look at it from the standpoint of, you know, the way that this movie is going to be, there are going to be flashbacks um, mm. to when the Losers Club were younger. And as we all know, and having seen different projects that a lot of those kids have been working on in the interim, in between this new movie coming out, we know that all of them have grown. Um, some of them have aged a little bit more than others that are obvious. Uh, Sophia Lillis, who plays Beverly Marsh, um, she pretty much looks exactly the same. But mm -hmm. some of the, I definitely think that some of the, the young men that they have on that show, they're definitely going to have to do a few things. I, I don't know what exactly they are going to do. Maybe, you know, there's a bunch of acne outbreaks or something. Who knows? <laughs> you know, uh, the voices are, are a little bit the deep. voices drop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see them do that. I really do hope that when this movie comes out, it is that we get a lot of the kids because honestly, uh, the kids and that aspect from the first movie was what I was the most interested in. I do, for the most part, like the casting of the elder you know, versions of the Losers Club. But <laughs> Except I, I for do, one. <laughs> yeah, but I do. But mm -hmm. I do like, you know, you know, all of these kids that are in it. You know, I'm, I'm very confident in the movie in itself, but the other exciting thing is that Stephen King um, is writing a scene, and Andy Muschietti had said in the same interview um, when talking about King um, being involved with the project, um, I'm going to read a quote from him. Um, it was absolutely huge for me. It would be an unthinkable it would be unthinkable when I was 12 or 13. So when the actor read the first dra draft of the sequel, um, Stephen King had made a few notes and requested addition of one all new scene. So Muschietti was pretty much saying that, you know, you don't tell Stephen King that he can't write, you know, a scene for that movie. Oh, so shit. they seem to be, yeah. So they seem to be very excited about it. I'm excited to see what that scene is going to be. And, um, what do um, both of you think about de-aging kids and Stephen King actually um, having a special scene in this movie? I'm kind of surprised that they didn't start immediately filming Chapter 2 right after the first one to catch yeah. the actors at the right age because we all know at that age, you know, the changes and developments you're making. So, um, I, mean, I mean, it's thankfully enough we have the technology that, you know, we can add and take away ages but it does kind of surprise me that they weren't ready to go right after the first one 
Yeah, same. Um, I'm super excited. It's kind of cool that Stephen King's writing one of the yes. scenes. And um, my ladies and I already have our tickets because it comes out on September 6th. We're going to make a, a thing of it. And that will also mark two years doing this show. So I am just super excited for this movie to come out. And I do wish it had been earlier, but at least we get our uh, little marker, benchmarker out of it for the show. Yardley, you and I are going to have to watch it together because that we watched, the last movie we watched together was the first It. Yeah, absolutely. And the, um, as far as, you know, we know that they took, what was it, like a year in between? Yeah. Um, It was Mm -hmm. like a year. I mean, what was it before they started shooting? I know there was a gap because I think It was supposed to come out earlier or something and then it got pushed back. But I think a lot of that is probably because, once again, these kids are a hot commodity and some of these kids have been doing other projects and when you get a bunch of kids who have a successful outing in a movie like it you become in high demand and people want to snatch them up and give them work because you know um stranger things is going on and you had you know the guy that's in it is in that but when kids are a hot commodity and there are other properties that want to use them while they're hot it's kind of hard to you know lock them down because people you know the other movies are saying hey they're young and we need to get them at this age as well so big ups to them also having other projects to work on and i look forward to see what they're going to be doing um after this movie comes out because i can tell you the kid that plays lucas he's got some bass (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, he's got some bass in his voice and you know it was sort of like the Bran Stark problem like how Bran is like seven foot and Hodor can't like you know, <laughs> put him off the map, you know? so it's going to be funny how they do it this technology is great because I saw the trailer um, I can't remember the name of the movie but it's got Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci in it and mm-hmm. they de-aged them for this Netflix movie mm-hmm. so uh, I'm excited about it and uh, I think they're in good hands because they actually put a certain percentage of the budget to the side off the jump because they knew that they were going to have to work on DH and the kids. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Uh, we are now moving into August, and that's usually when we get a lot of horror movies kick off because it's the fall, and for some reason, we, you know, lots of people choose to release their mo- their horror movies, so we have a plethora of movies to choose from that are hitting the movie theaters right now. Um, one of those, which I want to just segue into that one for Moni, is the scary stories to tell in the dark uh, that's coming up, right? Yeah, I was super excited. The, the trailers look awesome, and it's still Toro, but it's PG-13. It is based off a you know, middle-grade reader, basically, and I'm curious because they also, it's coming out next week, and they haven't let critics review it yet, which mm-hmm. isn't always the best sign. I, I, I have no doubt, and we already know from the, from the trailers, that it's going to be visually stunning, but whether or not it has gore to back it up, whether or not it's actually genuinely scary, I will be able to tell you because I am going to go see it um, next Sunday, actually. So uh, I will report back, but they've repackaged, all the bookstores have repackaged the old Scary Stories chapter books. Mm-hmm. So they've got like the new covers on them and everything. So that's good. I mean, selling some books, getting people to read. The, the books are genuinely creepy as hell, but... We'll see if they're able to capture that onto the big screen. Well, I'm kind of glad it's PG-13 because this is this is supposed to be scary for children, not, you know, not totally demographed to adults. I mean, adults can still enjoy it, but I'm glad they're not taking it to a level that, that children can't enjoy it because that's can't the whole point of it. it. Yeah. yeah. So at least but it'll be... I just hope that it's creepy is all. I mean, yeah. like, you can do creepy for all ages really right i just hope that it captures that i watched the trailer right before we started the show and it i mean it did give me some creeping so (laughs) i don't know fucking um bugs coming out of her face oh god yeah yeah talking about trailer number two i watched the first one i didn't watch i didn't know there was another one well well, there's another one that's way better than the first trailer Mm -hmm. and it, it definitely does have the the creep the, the, the creepiness to it so we'll see because i put all the best stuff into the trailers either yeah yeah, yeah. and because you know i i more so than the books themselves i remember a lot of the illustrations mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so some of these characters that i see on the screen are very recognizable so for me it's going to be like kind of revisiting it but mm-hmm. brand new so i look forward are to you that. gonna go see it probably yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm leaning, you know, because I mean, there are a few other things that I would probably prioritize above that, but sure. um, I, I don't feel like if I'm going in to see this, it's based off of books that were popular for children. I already know going in that 
uh, the critical nature that we sometimes have, that's out the window. I'm just yeah. going to watch it and yeah. just say, you know, it is what it is because, you know, hey, I, I like cheese too. You know, I, I like stuff that people will call, there's some stuff that I like that people will call stupid, but I enjoy yeah. it. Like Gollum? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, I watched yeah. it. Like, uh, yeah, like Gollum. That little kid. I mean, that little yeah. Gollum. That's pretty creepy. I just, I don't think it, it, I think Rotten Tomatoes has it at like 80 something percent fresh or 92%. I, I wouldn't take it that far. Um, I thought it was creepy, but I, I did think it was pretty cheesy. But yeah, that for some reason popped into my head when you said you like cheesy. But um, anyway, well, yeah, well, I'm excited. I'll probably go see it. There's a lot of movies I have on my list, though. I want to see Crawl. I want to see Midsummer, yeah. which I don't even, I haven't even looked to see if it's even around here. Seems to it that it had kind of a limited release. Yeah. Uh, now we've got um, It coming. We've got, uh, what else is coming out that's horror? It's like I'm missing one big one, but there's a lot hitting the theaters right now. So I'm going to try to do my best to see the majority of them. Uh, well, and just real quick, doubling mm-hmm. back to the illustrations and mm-hmm. scary stories, um, I remember being a brand new librarian and like the probably one of the first ever complaints, which uh, now there have been many people complain at libraries <laughs> all the damn time. Um, but we had a display that happened to have scary stories to tell in the dark on it. It was up high. So it wasn't like here, toddler, come look at it. But holy crap, did some Karen come in and be like, you got to hide these books in your stacks. You shouldn't even have these books. It's too oh, scary whatever. for kids. And like, lady, you're in the children's section. It's a children's reader book. It's, you know, it's been a bestseller. Like, anyway, chill out. So <laughs> Karen made us take it away because the uh, illustrations were too oh, spooky. Karen. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> So oh, I too, yeah. I'm glad that Christy called this out. Um, I usually do gross or spooky, <laughs> weird news, but I was having trouble getting into the mindset of, you know, being entertaining this morning. But I do think that what we do in, in entertaining people hopefully takes minds off of things. So yes. to get into that mindset, I found I was looking for kind of good, cute news. And this is just a quick little story about a woman in uh, Russia saw a job advertisement it was wanted cat chief location and i'm gonna butcher this zelenogrask russia duties tending to the town's approximately 70 stray cats so it's just a cute little video to uh, apparently they had 80 applicants who applied for the role with the municipality in a small town and they had the cat statue actually erected it added a feline to its emblem so they really gone whole hog on this whole cat thing. And I'm not the most cat loving person, but they're cute. And I, this is a cute story. So in the end, a local resident, Svetlana Lagunova, was appointed guardian of the town's felines. To help her with her task, she was given a bicycle and a uniform. So they know that she's doing good things with the cats, apparently, uh, including a bright green jacket, a black bow tie and a hat. I'm sure the cats can uh, <laughs> recognize her when she comes by. Mm-hmm. And she kind of looks like a like a character from a comic book, though, a little bit. But she receives the equivalent of $85 a month to ensure that all the seaside community cats are happy, dishing out food, petting them, and giving them free rides in the basket on her bike. So That sounds like I could totally sign up for that. I wonder if she gets paid on top of the money she gets to give to the cats. Or I would if it's imagine just like a volunteer. job application. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, and, you know, they do something at Comic-Con. It's called Cat Cafe. And you can pay. It's $20, mm-hmm. though. It's $20 for 20 minutes, but you can spend. I, or 20 minutes or an hour. But you can spend some time kind of away from the craziness of Comic-Con and this, like, air-conditioned little cafe and have coffee with cats. Mm-hmm. So I've never done it. I've just never had an hour to devote in the middle of all the work that I do there. But <laughs> this is a legit thing. It's therapeutic. And I think it's just kind of a cute little story. Well, anybody else who has who's has a uh, animal loving tendency like me, um, you can check out my Instagram right now because I'm chronicling the bunny nest that's been set up in oh my, my God, backyard. It's so cute, you guys! You and check it out. They are close to leaving the nest. Their eyes are open. They're hopping around every day. I bring them inside, and we've named them Rocco, Charlie, and Tyler, the creator. <laughs> and um, they are absolutely adorable. They I'm are already. So cute. I'm already crying thinking about them leaving, but we're trying to, like, get them kind of used to hanging around. Maybe they'll set up shop and uh, do the circle of life again around our area because, I mean, our ivy is perfect for bunny bunny houses. So 
hoping that we can take this ivy that I hate with all my being that I wish we could rip out into a positive and make it a little bunny haven because I've I've rescued animals my whole life. I think I must have some sort of like vacancy neon sign set up over my head because I've rescued bats, snakes, lizards, possums, squirrels, birds, everything you can possibly imagine ends up on my doorstep. Never had bunnies before, so my animal heart is so happy and, again, very close to leaving the nest. So check out my stories at Creepin' and Christy. I'm going to try to do an update today, but, of course, by the time you listen to this, it will be days later. But I will have them in my story highlights. So anyway. You want to know why? They're not going to set up shop. You know all the hawks and falcons oh, that yeah. are down here. Yep. I mean, you know, there's one I, in my backyard. I, yes. Yeah. I, all you're doing is prepping them. For that. <laughs> well, that's anywhere. I mean, at least like I was re- talking to a rehabber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was talking to a rehabber in Texas. That's a friend of mine, and she said that um, bunnies are known to be easy prey because mamas leave their the nests aren't exactly well hidden and um and they only, mamas only go to the nest twice a day to feed them um to try to not draw predators but also don't hide the babies very well so that morning when I first found them um I covered the nest up with ivy just enough so that mama could still find it but there is a hawk that's always hanging around because critters come out of that ivy all the time um, so he likes to set up shop uh, right next to my son's treehouse and scan for critters. So I was very concerned about that, and I have a metal bowl over the nest. So rain, because it's been raining a lot lately, um, and predators can stay out. So I've set up a little little bunny penthouse for them, so hopefully they'll come back. But, yes, I am totally in love with them and we already know it's any day now they'll believe they'll be leaving and me and my kids are going to be devastated but what you gonna do can't keep them can't be pets because they chew on everything i love people that have bunnies um but they are very destructive animals their teeth are always growing so they chew on everything my friend had to get new carpet of her entire house because they used to dig the bunny digs under the doors you close the door on him and he goes and digs yep (laughs) they'll dig they'll chew they'll do all kinds of shit so I had a friend who had pet bunnies she had to get rid of them too so I love them but they cannot come into my newly remodeled house (laughs) so anyway just wanted to add another little nice sparkle to our day because we're about to get into some seriously fucked up shit yeah thanks a lot Yardley (laughs) he's like hey what what podcast are we on (laughs) on (laughs) give us one yeah exactly um I just have apparently our rainbows and sunshine um everywhere else but when I read this news story I was like this is going to be my news story and thankfully since it's my week to um, create the document and the, the theme I a second I created this document and shared it with everybody else I threw down this link claiming it as my weird news because I was like this is perfect with our segue into the um, theme of our podcast today but I am sure most of you have already heard this, but holy shit, this is fucked up. A Missouri man says he found a baby's body in his mother's freezer. His mother passes away, and for his entire life, he's 37 years old, um, there has been a box, like a pastry box, wrapped in a white bag in the freezer of his mother's house. Um, He's always asked what it was, and she always said it was like a cake, like a cake topper, which I've seen old people do that before. I don't know why people are so caught up on saving cake or a topper, you know, like the top of the cake for a wedding or whatever, usually a wedding, um, and storing it in their freezer. Like, you're going to want to eat that after like 10 years or something. That's nasty, but people do do it. (laughs) It's gross. And get another one. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I find that strange, but to each his own. There are, you know, my, I like reading about this crazy shit. So I'm strange too. Um, he, uh, his mother passed away. And Adam Smith said he's known about the white cardboard box in his mother's freezer his entire life. He assumed it held a wedding cake topper or another memento that his mother was holding onto and left at that. He apparently, and I'm going off of the um, the inner the uh, article because I saw this on the news as well. He said that he, for his whole life he was asking 
what's in this box? And she would just be like, it's a cake topper, drop it, move on. Like, she was very stern with him about it. Um, now that he knows what's really in the box, he said he's struggling to comprehend how she kept it to herself all these years. Smith, 37, called police early Sunday morning and reported finding a dead infant in the box. Oh, can you imagine? Like, there is a picture, and it's showing a picture of the freezer, and right next to this box is a banquet, like, chicken pot pie, and, like, looks like maybe, like, ravioli or something. I mean, Salisbury steak. Uh, No thanks. Yeah, no. (laughs) St. Louis police said they are investigating the discovery as suspicious death pending an autopsy and asked for public for (laughs) tips. You think it's suspicious? (laughs) I mean... The white cardboard box was wrapped in garbage bags, Smith told CNN. It was the size of a boot shoe box and has been in his mother's freezer as long as he can recall. I remember being curious as a small child. I remember trying to grab a stool and rip through the plastic. Other than that, I never touched it. It traveled with his mother to four different homes in St. Louis, including the apartment on Magnolia Avenue where she lived for 25 years until her death. After she was diagnosed with lung cancer in January, Smith said he moved in with her to help care for her. She died July 21st. Then, early Sunday morning, Smith said he went into the freezer to get water bottle and decided to open the box. I still believe the box contained a wedding cake topper. That's just what I assumed, he said. He grabbed a kitchen knife, cut through the plastic, and opened the box. He saw a pink fleece baby blanket and reached inside. Oh, God. I just... I feel, like, seriously sick to my stomach reading this. Smith said he felt a foot and little toes. The blanket unraveled a little bit, and he said he saw a baby foot. As he tucked the fleece back inside, he saw the hair of the infant. The baby looked clean. There was no blood on it. It looked like a newborn baby. From what I could see, the skin and everything was intact. Smith said he immediately called police, who arrived within minutes. Now Smith has even more questions and theories. You think... I mean, yeah. I would assume um, memories from long ago are taking on new meaning, like the time his mom was upset when he was seven or eight years old. All she told me was my firstborn, Jennifer, would have been 20 years old today. Aha. Uh-huh. So yeah. that means she would have died about 50 years ago. Who absolutely? I sure hope that this baby died on its own. And, That's... you know, she just couldn't part with it rather than... Yeah. Um, that she killed it like we're going to talk about in our next story. Yeah, so. I have a feeling that's what happened. And yeah. that she, uh, for some weird reason, decided to keep it in the freezer. I yeah. don't that's understand that. That's a good that. way to put someone to rest is just to put it in the freezer. freezer. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so he's got some questions. He's assuming it's a baby, his baby sister, but I, with as much attention media-wise this has gotten, I'm sure we'll get some answers pretty quickly, yeah. uh, some follow-up on that. So, uh, Yardley, what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, um, all of my comments is with Mary Beth Tenning. Yeah. I mean, we're basically going to be right talking back. about something along the lines yes. for the rest of the show, so I'm, I'm good on comment on that. Yeah. It's fucked up. It's really fucked up. Um, I really needed to tackle this story, and here's why. Um, first of all, this woman is alive. Um, I categorize her as a serial killer, although I did a ton of research and reading about this woman and reports, medical reports about her, uh, and a lot of people do not categorize her as a serial killer. Um, but she is on parole right now. And so that is, Disturbing. this is an absolutely insane story. I, 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 first of all, I don't understand how you can be a lot, like live with yourself. First of all, I, well, I would never have done it in the first place, but still like, even if you were sick in the head, I just, this is just unconscionable. I'm just completely disgusted by this whole story. But there's serial killers, and then there's, like, people that you just can't. It just doesn't even, I don't know, penetrate your brain. Um, so I'll go into what our sources are. Uh, Wikipedia, People Magazine, Dr. Baden, who is a forensic pathologist, along with an episode of his show Autopsy, which I had um, Yardley and Moni watch just her segment, um, a TV show called Evil Women Sacrifice Their Blood, which was incredibly cheesy, 
but it kind of gave a little bit more of her, the personal life. Um, there's not a lot of information TV wise about her, but I did want to provide a few little videos here and there. Um, and then also, of course, CNN News, uh, once she was paroled, did a really a, quite a big profile on her. Um, for a devoted mother, Mary Beth Tenning seemed to have no luck at all in raising children. From 1972 through 1985, the Tennings lost nine children. In the opinion of doctors, the string of tragedies that befell the... I can never say... Schnecketty... Sh- how do you say that town? Schenectady, New York. I apologize, New Yorkers. I cannot say that word. I've tried several times. Anyway, housewife and her husband, Joe, was a matter of bad luck or bad genes, even though her sixth child, Michael, was not a blood relation. For some experts hypothesize, this drab housewife became addicted to being the star of the show, the bereaved mother at the funeral of her child. Mourners at these somber events would recall that Tenning seemed detached, sometimes even happy, as she bid farewell to all her children. Um, well, a first for me personally is to see a nationally recognized serial killer alive and out on parole as of 2018, still living in her hometown and still with her husband, who she was also accused of poisoning. Um, we'll get into that yeah. later. Crazy, crazy. Um, I recognize her as a serial killer personally, like I've already said, even though that's up for debate as far as experts are concerned. Most who are in the position to analyze murderers' behavior seem to think that a woman capable of murdering possibly eight of her children could only have Munchausen's by proxy and not be a serial killer. Uh, For me, though, I think it's both. How easy is it for someone who is an actual serial killer to just give birth and murder child after child when you realize there's really no repercussions during this time? Um, You know, this wasn't a recognized sickness. But also, there are women serial killers. I think that she's both. Um, So she loved the attention she received by the deaths, but she also enjoyed the process of beginning and ending the lives of these helpless babies. Uh, murder in any form is evil, but your own children, for me, is something that takes to a whole new level. Even the BT, even the BTK killer was a top-notch father who loved his children. I mean, when he was busted because of his own stupidity, his children were just, his family was absolutely floored. I mean, he was this, this model citizen, model father, uh, and he was a serial killer. Um, so I just, to do this to your own children is just insane. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the ball was dropped on prosecuting her. They thought all they'd need is to convict her for one death, which they did end up getting because she confessed. She was denied parole six times, and then in August of 2018, she was granted parole. Um, we're going to discuss the children, her life, her possible mental illness, and our thoughts on them not putting her up for trial on the other children's mysterious deaths, especially since she actually admitted at the time to killing three, not just one. Um, the children's mysterious deaths, who, including one who was actually adopted. Um, so we'll go into the, her early life now. Yardley. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, the reason why I probably, because I was up looking at the pictures. And yeah, it, yeah. It's, I, I, I was just, yeah. it's shocking <laughs> to really put it together and then actually see the faces of these babies. It's just... Yeah. Just, it's just yeah. disgustingly tragic. Um, well, in her early life, Mary Beth Rowe was born in Duanesburg, a small town in New York. Her father, Alton Lewis Rowe, who was deployed overseas fighting in World War II while her mother was working, due to both of her parents being away at times, Mary Beth was occasionally shuffled between nearby relatives for care. This is when one of her elderly relatives brazenly told her she was an accidental child and her birth was unwanted. When her little brother reached adolescence, Mary Beth would tell him, you were the only one they wanted, not me. Mary Beth was quiet, shy, and did not have many friends in school. Family members have stated that she attempted suicide a few times, but they were never believed to be serious attempts and were covered up by the family to keep the small town from talking. Her father, on completion of his active duty, worked as a press operator in a nearby General Electric facility. At the time, the facility was the area's largest employer. As an adult, Mary Beth once claimed that when she was a child, her father abused her. During a police interview in 1986, she told one investigator that her father had been beaten, had been beating her and locked her in a closet. 
During court testimony, she denied that her father had bad intentions. My father hit me with a fly swatter, she told the court, because he had arthritis and his hands were not much use. And when he locked me in my room, I guess he thought I deserved it. Mary Beth was an average student at Duanesburg High School and graduated in 1961. Over the next few years, she worked in a series of low-wage jobs. Eventually, she became a nurse's aide at Ellis Hospital in Shinnetati. Shinnetati, I think is how you say it. Shinnetati. Oh, okay. I think I finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that actually that that actually sounds like that's the way that it's pronounced. Um, in 1963, she met Joseph Tenning on a blind date with some friends. Joseph had very quiet personality and was was a very happy-go-lucky type of person. And the couple ended up getting married in 1965. Now, before um, we get to Moni's um, mm-hmm. segment, um, just kind of paying attention to how. You know, there were questions about whether she was abused, and then she, you know, says that that might not have been the case. And then there were things that her father did to her where, I guess in her head, she might have rationalized that, hey, you know, these things were okay. You know, I deserved it. A lot of these things, and none of this stuff happening for me excuses none of the shit that she Oh, hell no. No. But you can definitely, you can definitely see that there was a little, um, a little fuckery going on, you know, in her early life. Yeah. But I like you, Christy Ann Moni, I just don't know how you can kind of steamroll into being the person that she was. Cause, cause it almost feels like if you try to rationalize while she did it, it's almost like you're making an excuse yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? for her. So, I mean, it's just really weird, but uh, yeah, this, this is a sad story. I watched, it's going to get sadder. I watched some other videos uh, about her. Um, They were all just small snippets of segments like what I had shared. Um, And the uh, physical abuse from her father has been denied by most of the family. But what they don't deny is he emotionally just did not give two shits about her. Um, She was always wanting attention from him and never got it. And then when he died suddenly, um, which we'll get into uh, it, so she never, ever received kind of the tension she craved from her father. Um, it was always just, you know, he dealt with the negative stuff, her consequences and negative stuff. Um, again, like, I think we all have fucked up childhoods. I definitely did. Uh, mine sounds worse than hers was. And like you're saying, Yardley, this in no way justifies murdering your children. So, yeah, I mean, everybody's had a fucked up childhood. So it's kind of like whenever people do talk about this stuff or whenever it is brought up as sort of like a leeway into murderous rampages, I'm like, I call BS. (laughs) But anyway, it is what it is. Well, that and also in addition, and this was based off of some of the clips that you wanted us to watch with how when you look at uh, some of the things that you were just saying about Mm -hmm. her wanting to seek attention and all of those things, it does, there is definitely a connective thread behind some of the reasons why they feel like she went down down this path and some of it was attention-seeking. Now, I think that that, that that is so... I mean, it makes sense, but it's so crazy that something like that would end up in an extreme like that. But, right. you know, with defenseless, I mean, these these kids are beyond defenseless. Yeah. Right? It's mm-hmm. so, I yeah. don't know, it's so sad. And, and, and now I've had a flashback of that fucking clip in that video where the dude was like smothering that baby. Yes. Oh, yeah. my God. That was awful. Well, I mean, that I was, was awful. Um, you know, we did a show uh, months ago um, about Gypsy, Gypsy Rose. Rose. Um, yes. Same situation, Munchausen by proxy, but that mother never killed her child. She came close. Uh, Some she of the just things she did were worse, arguably. Right, but, right. Yeah. But um, but uh, and that's why I have such an an issue with um, people saying it was just Munchausen by proxy that um, propelled this woman into killing her children. I, I think she was a psychopath and had Munchausen by proxy um, because some women who have this, this whatever you want to call it, this mental illness, don't kill their children. They just keep them sick, which is awful too, but 
in my mind, I mean, one child dying, but nine, I just, it's insane to me. Uh, it, it's insane. She became addicted. You yeah. Know, it started yep. with just this, so I get attention. And then after it happened, it was like an addiction. Now I want food, more. You know? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, moving forward, it's just a, uh, I, I'm just floored. I know there's probably so many situations like this, you know, spanning back you know, since the dawn of man that we had not identified this. Um, we always, you know, take women as the mother and, you know, the t- caretaker and, and not so much with some people. <laughs> well, and they talk about in the videos that she may not have wanted to be a mom, that the reality of being a mom, and that, that is something I sympathize with a little, and honestly, <clears throat> getting ahead of myself, but Her kids were born so close together, she may have had some kind of hormonal issue, like postpartum Mm -hmm. type of stuff that carried on from pregnancy to pregnancy. But I don't know. Stop getting pregnant. And to describe her husband, Joseph, as happy-go-lucky and all this other stuff, that guy. He's an idiot. You know, yeah. He was right there with her and maybe worse in some ways, just in terms of, I don't know, by the second, third, fourth, fifth time, like, there's a pattern here. Maybe I yeah. stay off of her or find some form of birth control before this happens again, you know? Yep. So anyway, I will move forward into this and we can bitch about him in a minute. Mm-hmm. But um, in October, 1971, Tinning's father died of a sudden heart attack. And then in December, 1971, Jennifer, the Tinning's third child was born. Jennifer died only eight days old from a hemorrhagic, me- from hemorrhagic meningitis and multiple brain absences from birth. The child was lost due to natural causes, but introduced Mary Beth to the many, uh, air quotes, benefits that family deaths brought her. The subsequent attention that she received from family and friends following these deaths filled a void she had always longed for since childhood and became the catalyst of a heinous cycle of death. Joseph Tinning was born on January 10th, 1970, Mary Beth's second child, second to die, but first to be murdered. On January 20th, 1972, Mary Beth rushed Joseph into the hospital, uh, who she said she had had some sort of seizure. So she said he was having a seizure. He was revived and sent back home, but a few hours later, she returned with him, but the doctors could do nothing to save him the second time. Mary Beth told the doctors that she had put Joseph to bed for a nap. When she checked on him later, she found him tangled up in the sheets, and his skin was blue. Uh, A baby that young can't tangle it anyway. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They don't move like that. Mm -mm. The doctors did not perform an autopsy, but his death was said to be of cardiorespiratory arrest, or sudden infant death, as they call it now. Barbara Tinning was born on May 31st, 1967. She was Mary Beth's first child and third to die. On March 2nd, 1972, Mary Beth rushed her four-and-a-half-year-old daughter into the emergency room just six weeks after Joseph died, because she was suffering from convulsions. Okay, so that's the timeline. This child was mm-hmm. born first, but she didn't kill it until after the attention she received from killing the second child. Got it. Yes. The doctors wanted to uh, wanted to keep Barbara overnight, but Mary Beth refused to leave her there and took her home. A few hours later, they returned to the hospital, but that time Barbara was unconscious. She died later. She later died at the hospital, and her cause of death was brain edema, which is the swelling of the brain. Timothy Tenning was born on Thanksgiving Day on November 21st, 1973. He was Mary Beth's fourth child and fourth to die. When he was only three weeks old, Mary Beth found him in his crib dead. The doctors would not find anything wrong with him, so they said the cause of his death was sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. After this, in 1974, a high-stress period for the couple, you think, when you have all these kids dying, um, a near-fatal dose of barbiturates somehow got into Joseph Tenning's grape juice, her husband. His wife later admitted to mixing up the cocktail with pills she had picked up for her friend's epileptic child. He refused to press charges and is with her still to this day. Uh, yeah. yeah. So wouldn't you have realized kind of, wouldn't there be some red flags going off if all your children are dead and she poisoned you? Totally. Totally. Um, moving on next was Nathan who was born Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1975. Oh, his little face, his little mohawk. He does. (laughs) He was the Tenning's fifth child and fifth to die. 
On September 2nd, 1975, Mary Beth rushed him to the hospital and told the doctors that she noticed him not breathing while she was driving. The doctors could not find what was the cause of death, so they just said it was acute pulmonary failure. Uh, at this time, a little bit segue, um, the belief began to circulate in the town of Schenectady, New York, that the Tinning family suffered from a quote-unquote death gene. Mary Beth was asked by concerned acquaintances and family members why she continued to bring more babies into the world since they seemed yeah. destined to die so young. Mary Beth said that she was a woman, and that's what women are supposed to do. Neighbors, friends, and family grew more suspicious with each death. When they saw Mary Beth with a belly, they'd wonder, how long will this one last? Sorry, every time you say Schenectady, I want to go, Schenectady, do 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 Schenectady, do 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 You say it better than me. I, every time, it's like I know that's what it sounds like, but then when it's time for me to read it, my brain goes blank, and I'm like, it's Schenectady. <laughs> <laughs> On October 29th, 1978, the Tennings had a baby girl, Mary Frances. She was their seventh child and sixth to die. She was only a few months old. Mary Frances experienced seizures but was treated and sent home. She died a month later, a few hours after arriving at the hospital. Jonathan was born November 19th, 1979. He was the Tennings' eighth child and seventh to die. Mary Beth rushed him to the hospital because he was unconscious, and even the specialists at the hospital could not figure out why he was unconscious, so they sent him back home. Three days later, he was again rushed to the hospital, but there was nothing they could do because he was already dead. The cause of death was cardiopulmonary arrest. The Tinnings were still in the processing of adopting two-year-old Michael. He was their sixth child and eighth to die. Mary Beth called Michael to the doctor. Uh, carried Michael to the doctor, but it was too late. He was already dead. The autopsy showed that he had pneumonia, but it was not severe enough to kill him. On October 22, 1985, the Tinnings had another girl, Tammy Lynn. The doctors monitored her for four months, and she was a healthy child. On December the 20th, she died from being smothered. That day, the Tinning family was visited by Betsy Mannix of Schenectady's County County's Department of Social Services and Bob Enfield of the Chenect. Why in the hell? I just- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Chenectady Police Department. Police Department. Oh, Lord. Of Tammy Lynn. Now, do y'all think, you know, these days, mm-hmm. when you have so many of these deaths happening, I mean, at, at, at what point does the, you know, gosh, like the hospital... <laughs> I mean, I just don't know. Like, at some point, you've got to say, all right, you know, this is a little bit too fishy, Mm -hmm, you know, but what do you do? I mean, do you feel like you're going to get into somebody's, you know, hey, I I need to mind my business. I don't know what's going on. Or are you going to be the babies, you know? Yeah, you know, and Uh, it just seems like pattern wise, you would think that the hospital itself would have been putting together just certain threads. I mean, we know that they have records, but Mm -hmm. I mean, this totally has to be the talk of the town. Everybody has to know this woman. Everybody, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like there are just too many people in between these things happening for people to, you know, to not say, hey, there are some shenanigans. However, the one thing that she did have in her credit was that the diagnosis that the doctors were signing off on, some of them were saying, hey, we think that it's this, and there's no criminal activity. Like, if you read some of those reports, mm-hmm. so she did have that, you know, these medical these viable medical reasons for these children to be dying, but it's just that, you know, they're just so close together and all that stuff. It's just, I don't know. Also, um, which I didn't put in here, I might have put in later, um, but uh, through all of these children's deaths, they moved three times, and she was really good at taking the children to different hospitals, even some that were slightly out of town, and different Uh doctors. And, you know, back then they didn't have digital files of, you know, so if she's going from one hospital to another hospital, they didn't connect what was what. Now the friends and family, I don't, I have major side eyes on. Um, but if a hospital is getting, you know, two of these children's deaths, it might not be as raised eyebrows as nine. So because she was smart about taking them to different doctors and different hospitals, which is what a lot of people with who suffer 
with Munchausen by proxy do to get the right diagnosis that they want or to, like this woman was, covering tracks back in these days when they didn't have, you know, files where, you know, the second you log in your name, everything from everywhere pops up now. Uh, back then it wasn't like that. Plus moving a lot happened because they were getting, they were getting like talk from the neighborhood um, but one of these, the woman, like a neighbor friend was on and she was like, yeah, I was just kind of like went to the cemetery with her and there's all these gravestones and it was like, whoa, and really? And you didn't think, hmm, <laughs> you know, it's just bizarre to me that the family and the, their close friends didn't put this together. I, I and would I, I'm just not cut out that way. I would have gone to her, you know, after the third one and been like, stop. Stop fucking! Yeah. <laughs> like, no more! Like, how, you can't do this. It's torture, mm-hmm. you know. Like, come on! But anyway, it's just crazy, crazy that people didn't say anything. This bitch should have earned. She's a, she's, a, she's a rabbit by human standards. Uh, yeah, yeah, shit. yeah just keep on having babies. She mm-hmm. should have uh, earned some kind of medical degree for her ability to recognize when a child was beyond saving before she brought it to the hospital. No shit. <laughs> So investigators had an eye on the situation for years. Well, good good stepping in, guys. After after Tammy Lynn's death, they decided it was time to ask the grieving mother some tough questions. After a long interrogation, she admitting to killing three, Timothy, Nathan, and Tammy Lynn. I smothered them each with a pillow because I'm not a good mother. Hey, understatement of the year. Joe Tinning was brought into the station, and he encouraged Mary Beth to be honest. In tears, she admitted to Joe what she had admitted to the police. The interrogators then asked Mary Beth to go through each of the children's murders and explain what happened. A 36-page statement was prepared, and at the bottom, Mary Beth wrote a brief statement about which of the children she killed, Timothy, Nathan, and Tammy, but denied doing anything to the other children. (laughs) She signed and dated the confession. According to what she said in the statement, she killed Tammy Lynn because she would not stop crying. She was arrested and charged with second-degree murder of Tammy Lynn. I don't know why when she confessed to the other two, anyway. Yeah. The investigators could not find enough evidence. Uh, How about a confession? Yeah, except for that she admitted it. (laughs) Well, okay, so the other, other children, but the three she admitted to, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. The bodies of the three Tinnings children were exhumed, but little was learned from them. So advanced was the decomposition. Tinning was charged with the murder of only one child, Tammy Lynn. Her husband, Joe, had been questioned, but was quickly determined that he had no hand in these killings except for being complicit and not noticing anything wrong Mm -hmm. and being dumber than shit. Uh, Mary Beth was alone with the babies at the time. Schenectady Police Chief (laughs) Richard E. Nelson contacted forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden to ask him some questions about SIDS. One of the first questions he asked was if it was possible that nine children in one family could die of natural causes. Baden told him that it wasn't possible and asked him to send him the case files. Um, Really quick before I continue reading this, um, this was actually one of the episodes that I had um, Yardley and Moni watch. And... It is, um, his show is absolutely fascinating. I'm now binging it. I'd seen it before, but it's been years. And um, he has a show called Autopsy. And it is, uh, it's really interesting if you're really into some of the fucked up shit that I am. Uh, So recommended. Uh, He did get involved in this. He's kind of the nation's lead forensic pathologist. So um, when there's crazy cases like this, they'll pull him in. Um, So he asked, he was asked to, He asked them to send the case files so he could review them. He also explained to the chief that children and babies who die from sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, also known as crib death, do not turn blue. They look like normal children after they die. If a baby was blue, he suspected it was caused by homicidal asphyxia. Someone had smothered the children. Dr. Baden later wrote a book in which he attributed the deaths of the Tinning children as a result of Mary Beth suffering from acute Munchausen by proxy syndrome. Dr. Baden described Mary Beth Tinning as a sympathy junkie. He said she liked the attention of people feeling sorry for her from the loss of her children. At her trial, which opened June 22, 1987, her attorneys tried to inject a dose of reasonable doubt with scientific experts. They said it was possible that a rare genetic brain disorder had affected at least two of the children and perhaps all of them, but the prosecution easily poked holes in that theory. 
On July 17th, after three days of deliberation, the jury found Tenning guilty of murder in the second degree. During sentencing, Mary Beth read a statement in which she said she was sorry that Tammy Lynn was dead and that she thought about her every day, but that she had no part in her death. She also said she would never stop trying to prove her innocence. The Lord above and I know that I am innocent. One day the whole world will know that I am innocent and maybe then I can have my life back once again or what is left of it. She was sentenced to 20 years to life and was sent to Bedford Hills Prison for Women in New York. She was denied parole six times after serving her 20 years. In March 2011, Mary Beth was more forthcoming during this, her fourth parole hearing. She admitted to smothering Tammy Lynn with a pillow, but continued to insist that her other children died of SIDS. As to describe what insight she had about her actions, she answered, when I look back and see a very damaged and just a messed up person, sometimes I try not to look in the mirror, and when I do, I just, there's no words that I can express now. I feel none. I'm just, just none. She also said she has tried to become a better person and ask for help and help from others. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I super believe that. I tried, guys. I tried. Mary Beth was denied parole due to lack of empathy and refusal to admit wrongdoing. Joe Tinning continued to stand by Mary Beth and visit her regularly. Oh, they should have had conjugal visits. Ew. No shit. (laughs) Maybe that one would Uh, die because they'd get taken from her. Right. Or I mean, that one would live, excuse me. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Although Mary Beth commented during the last parole hearing that the visits were becoming more difficult. You fucking think so? A uh, 75 year old Mary Tinning was released from Taconic Correctional Facility in, in Bedford Hills in upstate New York on August 20th, 2018. So we're coming up on her one year of being paroled, guys, mm-hmm. after 31 years behind bars. Her husband was there for her released and is believed to have taken her home that they shared before the incarceration. Oh, so all the ghosts of all the babies surround mm. her too. She has a curfew, whoopty fucking do, because she really killed these babies after hours, I'm sure. Yeah. And must attend domestic violence counseling. Experts believe tending this case to be an early example of Munchausen by proxy. The condition first identified in the 1970s involves caregiver the, a caregiver fabricating health problems of the person they are caring for with the intent to gain sympathy and attention, a la Gypsy Rose's mom. Yeah. Uh, residents and local elected officials are outraged by Tinning's release. <laughs> Schenectady, <laughs> Schenectady, wow, yeah. County District Attorney Robert Carney has opposed her release even though he didn't prosecute the case. He also told people he doesn't think she showed true remorse for the murder, citing her inconsistent accounts and appearances before the parole board. The problem I have is that she showed absolutely no insight into her behavior or acknowledged in any way what she has done. I can't believe you can say that she's rehabilitated when she refuses to admit the true extent of her conduct. Well, the one thing I can say is that I'm glad that she is past the age of bearing children, although, oh, my God, if they let her adopt. Yeah, or get around, like, you know, other children or be like a babysitter or some crazy shit. Yeah. Um, New York State Senator Jim Tedisco uh, has also vocally opposed Tenning's release. It's ridiculous to let someone out that has done that to children. I am definitely outraged, but also sad and fearful. Audrey Hodling, who babysat for Tenning's son, Michael, before the two-year-old's 1981 death, stated that her first reaction to learning about the release was, I don't want to see her face. No shit, I wouldn't either. I don't think Mary Beth Tenning should ever see the light of day, New York Republican State Summit Senator Jim Tedisco told CBS 6 in Albany. Tenning will be under parole su- supervision for the rest of her life. Tenning is being supervised by Schenectady County, said State Department of Corrections and Community Supervi- Supervision Spokesperson Thomas Maley in a statement. For safety and security... For safety and security reasons, the department does not issue specific residential reporting or employment information for individuals on community supervision. So, yeah. So, there we are. She's free. She's back living in the same town she was and with her husband, who she tried to poison and whose eight, at least eight children um, she killed. So, (laughs) there's that. Thoughts? (laughs) 
Oh, having it on a mute is something that I think I should. Do <laughs> right, that's, that's probably a problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it was a shit show. Yeah. Yeah. Thin. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just nothing else to really, to really say. add to that. But I agree with you, Moni. I mean, the husband. It's it's almost oh. like I'm just as mad at um, his kind of lack of. I, I just, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of crazy because I don't want to assume that I know what's in people's heads and all in all of this, but it just seems like, I mean, do y'all feel like he really, you know, that, that he knew about this stuff and was, I mean, like, how do y'all feel about it? Not after five, six, you know. I, I would have said after the second. I would have said after just, the second uh, one. Yeah. I, I can't I imagine. Just, uh, Even if you think it's a genetic thing, maybe we're not cut out to be parents, you know? Yeah. A <laughs> lot of um, family members apparently did go to Jim and ask, like, what's going on? And do you, you know, do, do you think something nefarious is going on? And the only thing he would say over and over again is you have to believe the mother. Like, that was basically his... Even after she tried to poison me. Yeah, and the thing that, and I don't want to assume or be mean, but I don't get that their IQ is very high with the, between the two yeah. of these two. I just don't think that they, I, I, just something, just watching everything just seem, they, they seem extremely low IQ as well. Especially yeah. Joe, he seems very Thank simple. You. Uh, he didn't, I, I don't know how. Maybe they didn't need to have kids either. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, certain genes we need in the world, y'all. So question between the two of you, um, out of the nine, I personally believe she killed eight. Um, do you believe she killed those eight or do you think she killed all nine or do you think she killed four? I mean, what do you, what's I'm your. With you. I, I, I think it was eight. Yeah. 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 I think maybe, I mean. Maybe the tragedy was the, I mean, it's all a tragedy, but maybe the thing that was real might have been the first one. Yeah, I yeah. believe it was, just because it never left the hospital. I don't know where, I mean, it's possible she could have killed the baby in the hospital, but I just don't think, I think that was the, the light switch that went off when she started yeah. getting flooded with all of that this. Addiction for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the attention that she was getting and... um and also had kind of a psych, she was psychotic. I mean, she had the tendency in her all along to do this, but that was the, that was like they said, the catalyst to, to get it going. I really, truly think that she's a serial killer. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that she had Munchausen by proxy, but I don't, I think it was both combined. Um, there's a lot of people who argue about that. It's, there's a whole, there's forums on it, actually. One of the first videos I watched was a man who basically has a rating system for killers. And it's, from, I think, 1 to 20 or 1 to 15. And he rated her as like an 8 um, with mental illness, basically. And there was this uproar online about it. They were saying there's no fucking way. It's just mental illness. Um, and he seemed to go really easy on all the women serial killers. And oh. so they think he's just old and has, you know, has this affinity for women thinking are so delicate. women they are weak. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, yes. She didn't stab them, Christy. Come no, on. No, exactly. Some mothering she them. them or put their bodies in freezers. So. And I tend to believe, <laughs> and I don't want to be gross and, and think about this too much, but we are talking about it. But I tend to believe that with the um, her poisoning her husband, I have a feeling some of the babies were also poisoned instead of all of them being smothered. But that's just my thing. Oh, Maybe. Worse. I didn't even think about that. I mean, yeah. if she did that to her husband, I know I'm, I hate to be thinking about it, but I have been researching this for a week now. So it is literally in my head. I'm getting all the thoughts out now so that I can freaking move on with my life because yeah. um, as fascinated as I was with analyzing somebody who is alive and free today and responsible in my mind for eight deaths of, you know, eight children's deaths. I really needed to tackle this, but I also, it also brought up a lot of like horribly horrible thoughts in my mind. So I'm getting them all out now. Um, I do believe that that's probably could have been the first, um, the first few deaths like could have been poisoned because of the way she uh, did her husband, but that's just my personal 
opinion. And, um, I mean, because later on they, you know, she brought the ones in that were blue and that would have been the smothering, but the others were not blue. So anyway, that is that. It is an awful story. This woman is alive and walking around um, New York as we speak. So uh, I did also see a couple of people chime in to some of these um, articles that I was reading uh, last year about her release who were actually live in that town and one of them had seen her walking around the grocery store with her husband. So uh, it it just is surreal to me that this woman is free and alive and existing, you know, and a known killer. I mean, of course, there's people out there that <laughs> have killed that we don't know of that are free and walking around, but I think this is the first serial killer I've ever seen free just walking around. So she's, you know, you know, she's free and walking around, but what better city to be in in New York for like nobody to know who the hell you are. That's true. I mean, like nobody, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you know, that's probably what it is. I mean, she's got, she's very, you know, an ambiguous, you know, yeah. Um, she should have to register person. as a baby yeah. killer the way people register as sex offenders. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sad. But um, are y'all ready to find out what we're going to talk about in the yep. next show? And Yardley's yes, and got next week, and we're going to clear our palate from all this child murdering that I have been uh, um, throwing at us <laughs> and, crawl, yeah, just... and crawl into a review. How about that, eh? Well, yeah, but, you know, th- those are the types of stories that nobody takes pleasure in telling. But at the same time, you know, it's just kind of a reminder. You know, yeah. that people do horrible things, and we I think we do a pretty fair job of kind of, you know, flipping the switch on the different topics that we talk about. So Absolutely. everybody knows that I'm pretty much along the line of doing movie reviews and things like that. It's what I enjoy the most, and there is a movie called Crawl that is currently out, and for those who have not heard about it, here's a summary. When a massive hurricane hits her Florida town, young Haley ignores the evacuation orders to search for her missing father, Dave. After finding him gravely injured in their family home, the two of them become trapped by the rapidly encroaching floodwaters. With the storm strengthening, Haley and Dave discover an even greater threat than the rising water level, a relentless attack from a pack of gigantic alligators. Yes. I mean, yeah. This (laughs) is a pretty brilliant theme as far as I'm concerned on horror, something we've never tackled before. I'm excited. I mean, I... I, I, it's, I, I'm really excited about it. What a great yeah, concept. I mean, and not only am I more excited about it, it's just that, you know, technology is caught up to where you can do some awesome, you know, mm-hmm. alligator action going on. And yeah. I just love the fact that we'll be able to see this. I wouldn't necessarily say that this is like a high end thriller because I don't think that the budget was, well, was that big for it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, a lot of the clips, and the previews that I've seen from it, I've been pretty impressed. And, you know, and the buzz is that it's a, you know, it's a it's a decent movie. So what more can you ask? Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Uh, really yeah. quick, um, before we say our goodbyes, I wanted to thank everybody who started to leave us reviews and ratings. I really appreciate it. If you have a time to take a moment after this show and just give us a quick review on whatever platform you're listening through, uh, it really does help us. Um, we, again, I, I say this a lot, but this is not our full-time job. We don't have a lot of time to dedicate to marketing and everything like that. So we really do rely on y'all's shout-outs and reviews to get us where we need to be. So thank you again, and please continue to leave us reviews when you can. Um, with that, do you, Moni, would you like to announce where we can find you on your social medias? Sure. I'm at Moni, M-O-N-I-B-A-R-R-E on Instagram and Rebel Moni with an M-O-N-Y on Twitter. Yardley? You can follow me on Twitter at Militant underscore Marker. You can find me on Instagram at Creepin' at Christy. Again, follow my rabbit chronicles and some other shit I throw out. I uh, like to do a lot of uh, reviews on fun things that I love finding good deals and makeup and Uh, Again, I like fucked up a sense of humor and also animals. So that's pretty much what you're going to see thrown at on my social media. And we also have a Facebook page where we like to share some um, more crazy stories, usually from Florida, 
Uh, some of them coming from Ireland and Russia now. And some funny memes and horror stuff. We're probably really going to kick it up now that we're getting into the Halloween season. So uh, join us over there, too. Um, with that, I want to tell everybody thank you for listening and joining us. And everybody stay safe and be kind to each other out there. Uh, with that, we will creep it real. Oh,